for your presentation with us. Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, but also Maureen and uh, Jan for organizing this and also um, inviting me and providing the opportunity to share some of our research um, results, current, um, but also the past research. Um, so I'm assistant professor at DPFL and um, my research focus is on developing intelligent maintenance and operation systems. So what we normally care about is um, looking into um, complex systems um, where we, we have seen with time that the complexity has been increasing. So it's not possible to just look into single components, but really going um, to the systems of systems approaches. Um, and obviously, particularly um, condition monitoring, but also operational data and uh, the evolving algorithms um, have been potential enablers to provide some of the solutions um, to improve this monitoring, uh, but also um, optimal operation of such systems. Um, however, what we are typically um, facing as challenges uh, that since we are really interested in the rare events that are happening, so faults, predicting them or detecting them early on and predicting how the condition um, of the system will be evolving, um, this is where we're really not able to learn from examples. Uh, but also um, systems are typically highly diverse and um, they're um, operated in very diverse operating conditions. So this is um, what makes the algorithm development a bit challenging for us. Um, but they also enable to, um, in order to, to enable the scaling, uh, we really need to provide a sufficient generalization ability, uh, which um, is again one of the challenges we're working on. Um, and finally, uh, we also need to provide um, decision support to the decision makers um, and partly integrating the, um, the domain expertise knowledge um, in the algorithms in order to enable us to overcome the, um, the challenges and potentially missing data for, for these cases. Um, and the tools that we are um, using or, or uh, where we are starting with, on the one hand, we may have quite a lot of data that could be available for us where we may not um, require um, physical models. But on the other hand, um, in many cases, we do already have um, a lot of models, um, um, physics-based models available. Um, and this is um, a bit the challenge, um, but also the opportunity to combine the two um, and, and bring the best of the two worlds together. Um, and in order to address those challenges, um, we're actually working on four different layers. Um, and in the first layer, we are really focusing this transferability and generalization ability. Um, and again, the challenges um, of these complex fleets of systems um, is that um, we do have um, very dissimilar mission profiles. We do have very dissimilar operating conditions, but typically um, we, we don't have possibly so many systems that are really kind of the same. So we have a heterogeneous um, system configuration uh, where we may have fleets of those uh, where we just have um, very unique systems. Um, and again, we have those rare faults um, that we are um, facing as a challenge. Um, so in order to um, address those challenges, um, we, are, we, are, uh, we are developing algorithms that enable us um, to transfer um, um, algorithms that we are developing between different operating conditions uh, within a system um, but also between different units of a fleet, so transferring from a new, uh, from an experience unit to a new unit, for example. Um, but also in case if we have um, some simulators that are not uh, precisely matching the reality, this is also again where we are able um, that enables us to overcome this um, this domain gap um, to um, to come closer to the real conditions. Um, just to give um, some of the examples on the topics that we are working on, um, so um, let's assume that we have um, a new system that we are taking into operation. Um, and once we have a new system, potentially we, we, could, uh, we may have some other systems on which we already developed the model. Um, so in the simplest case, we could just say that we can actually take the model, the algorithm that we developed for an existing system, just plug it in for the new one. Um, but what it typically results in that um, the um, performance is really dropping quite significantly. So the goal here is um, on the one hand um, to use the experience of this experience unit um, and really to try to transfer it to the new unit. Um, and in order to do so, um, one of the approaches we have been um, developing is um, the field of domain adaptation. So to overcome this domain gap and really bring the two um, operating conditions or really to adjust to the, um, to the new system. 
Um, and one of the challenges again there, as already mentioned, is that we actually don't have sufficient faulty data that is available for us. And particularly if you have a new system, this is really not possible for us to, um, to have already a lot of um, faults that may have occurred. Um, so this is um, what we have been trying to overcome, that we already can start applying the algorithms very early on, even if we don't have any faults um, that have occurred on that system. Um, and um, how can we really um, adjust um, the, the model that we have on the experience unit um, to the new unit? One of the other fields that we have been working on um, is condition monitoring with sound. Um, and um, it's a very um, kind of cheap monitoring method um, that can be applied for a lot of um, um, different process monitoring approaches. Uh, one of the contributions that we made here is um, how to um, process the data in a more um, automated way. Uh, normally it's done with a lot of manual fine tuning um, of the um, pr parameters for the signal processing. Um, and what we propose here is um, a fully learnable um, algorithm. And we just take the raw signals and then plug in our algorithm that is um, computationally also very efficient. And this enables us, for example, to distinguish um, healthy from unhealthy data by only training the algorithm uh, with healthy conditions. And in this case, it may look already from, um, uh, even if we see, um, if we look on the signal, it already looks quite obvious. Um, but there are a lot of cases where um, their, their health or their um, fault condition is only starting to evolve. And even in these conditions, the algorithm is able to um, detect robustly the, um, the faulty conditions. Um, one of the other challenges that we are facing is um, um, that we are typically, um, there are a lot of um, environmental conditions that are actually impacting our data. Um, this is visual data, this is um, railway sleepers, um, and the task here is to detect the um, anomalies on the sleepers. So for example, such in this case, it would be the spalling or the cracks on the sleepers. And this is what we would like the algorithm to be sensitive to. Um, but obviously in the real conditions, there are a lot of um, um, deviations or variability that is actually could be resembling also um, kind of the real defects, um, but that we would like not to be um, sensitive to while still being able to detect the faults that we are interested in. Um, this was a project um, with SPB um, where um, we were able to improve the robustness of the algorithms um, of the algorithm quite significantly. Um, so this was for the first layer. And then the second layer, um, this is where we actually start adding the physics-based models um, on top of the data-driven approaches. So the first layer is really um, typically um, kind of, um, very, very data-driven. Um, and this is where we start going towards um, hybrid operational digital twins. Um, and the idea here is um, kind of to, to be able to benefit from the physics-based models. Typically, we are somewhere in the middle where we do have some data, but also we have some physical models, um, potentially um, very good, um, very detailed physical models, but in, in some cases, potentially not. <laughs> Um, and this is particularly relevant for the cases where we don't, we are not, where we are not just interested in detecting faults, but also predicting um, the remaining useful lifetime. Because, but um, particularly for those time to failure trajectories, we don't have many of them um, from which we can actually train the models. Um, and in this particular case, um, we may be able um, to, to model the physics of failure in very detailed way, but those are really um, only available for um, a handful of, of systems. Uh, but um, particularly there is uh, performance models, um, the thermodynamical models, we, we may have access to those um, and we do have for many different systems. Um, and this is where we could actually start benefiting from them, that they're not, they're not modeling directly the failure mechanisms, but they enable us to still um, monitor the impact of the faults um, on, the signal, um, on the signals and using this information um, in a better way. So this is uh, where we actually have our um, calibration-based hybrid algorithms um, that actually um, is um, providing us a system-based model here. Uh, we are calibrating the system-based models with their model with their measurements that are coming in constantly here. So it's um, calibration being performed in real time. And this enables us not just to take the measurements into consideration, but also to infer the virtual sensors and the calibration parameters that um, have shown to be very informative of the health condition. Um, so then we are um, kind of enlarging the input space to our, um, to our algorithms and then um, training the algorithm to predict the remaining useful life. 
Uh, we applied to it um, on a case study of turbofan engines. Um, this is where we collaborated with NASA. Um, and this really enabled us, um, on the one hand, to prolong the prediction horizon. So the question is, how early on are we actually able to predict um, precisely when the end of life of the component would be? Um, but what it enables us to enable us to do is also to be able to um, you know, reduce the training data size while still uh, remaining or maintaining the same prediction accuracy. Um, in the same um, direction, uh, we have been also working um, on, on battery discharge models. Um, so the question there is to infer precisely um, the, the aging parameters since the discharge curve of batteries is really highly dependent. Um, on the um, on the current um, aging state of the battery, um, and this is rather um, usually very difficult to infer. And um, this is um, typically done in a um, in a lab uh, where those uh, where those um, aging parameters are estimated and then used for prediction later on. Um, so what the algorithm is actually doing is um, it's taking the um, the very first small part of the um, uh, discharge trajectory together with the load. Um, and based on that, it's able to infer the aging parameters, and then we can um, take um, any variable um, predicted load profile. So if we know how our system is going to be operated, we can then predict when the end, um, end of this charge is going to happen. Um, and again, we collaborated with NASA on the um, lithium-ion battery um, simulator, particularly for the aging behavior. Um, and um, on the simulator data, the results look, um, look really um, very good, um, and we, get, we are able to predict um, the discharge trajectory um, very precisely, also with very complex discharge um, load profiles. Um, however, if we take now um, new data, or if we take real data, what we actually notice is there's um, a small deviation, particularly at the end of the discharge trajectory, that was not modeled by the model. So um, this one uh, was, was not possible to be captured by the model behavior. However, if you just take a couple of um, trajectories of real trajectories and fine tune the model that we trained before, we're really now able also to close this gap that was not part of the, um, of the simulator. If we then now start um, looking at the entire program or um, all the um, collector data, uh, we, we can really see that this fine tuning helped us to overcome this, um, the, this gap between the simulated and the real environment. Um, and if you look how many samples we actually need to fine tune, um, and already just taking 10 um, of the real trajectories um, improves our performance quite significantly, and then taking more um, doesn't help um, that much anymore. So this was the second layer. Um, in the third layer, uh, we are trying to take um, to make use of um, of the prediction models that we developed before, and this is where the goal is um, not just to predict, but also to use the information in a more proactive way and to prescribe how the systems should be operated in order to prolong the remaining useful life. For example. Um, and this is um, what where we again looked at the batteries a bit um, and how to um, extend um, the discharge cycle um, by um, by allocating the load in a multi-battery pack um, in in an optimal way, such that we are able to um, to end it um, to reach the discharge and um, the end of discharge um, as late as possible. Um, and in the very last um, layer, so in the fourth layer, this is uh, where we're on the one hand combining the information from the previous layers, um, and we're also aiming to provide um, decision support um, to the decision makers. Um, and one of the examples here um, is uh, from a ton of boring machine operators, uh, where the goal was to learn from the experienced operators and then um, to provide them support to the less experienced ones, um, how to adjust the parameters in such a way that they are um, able to reach um, the same progress rates um, under very different conditions um, as the experienced operators uh, would have. Um, so this was um, a project with a ton of boring machine um, um, manufacturer um, where data was collected um, from, um, from several similar um, tunnel boring um, 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 tunnel, um, board, um, board tunnels. Um, and the goal was really then um, to learn from them to define the optimality parameter um, and, and train the algorithm to predict it. And once it is trained, we can then go back and then um, provide recommendation which parameters should be adjusted um, in order to, um, to improve the progress rate and to improve the performance also of the less experienced operators. 
Um, so these are the four layers on which we um, we have been working on, and um, we have been um, collaborating with many different industrial partners. Um, not so much yet in in the food industry, uh, but um, on many different complex systems. And with that, I guess I'm I'm really good in time, and um, I give over to the next one.